Um, so uh, the hallmarks of aging have been described before the hallmarks came out, as you see at the bottom, um, 2013, a prominent internal cell. Um, the, uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of debate about, you know, how to define aging. I think it was more contentious, but now there's this sort of these consensus uh, features. Uh, certainly can, will be revised over time with more details. Um, but so aging um, is found to involve um, increased genomic instability, sort of shorter transcript lengths, um, and uh, shortening actually of the genes. Um, there's some um, so loss of the this proteostasis is a technical term for uh, cellular function in the protein uh, output of the cell. So, so Dr. basically, Toy, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're still seeing the original title slide. Oh, wow, it's not doing advanced analytics. Okay. So right now, is there advancing or no? Is there movement? Yeah, I'm on objectives. If that's the slide you're on in your in your discussion, that's what we're seeing. Did, did it go to hallmarks of aging? Yes. Yep, now we're seeing that. And I think you're probably going to have to go to the left-hand side and just click down. Okay. Yeah, right. thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, sorry, going back. Um, so, so now you see the hallmarks of aging. So these are... Um, you know, from this paper, there's a lot of sort of consensus about um, these are um, genomic instability, loss of protein uh, kind of stability or cell function as defined by protein output, um, and some um, decreased um, metabolism function of the cell. Um, so um, stem cells also um, reduced overall in terms of exhaustion and changes in communication of, between cells. Um, and then important to point out that aging is not uh, synonymous with uh, one's chronological you know, calendar age, um, but these are considered, you know, biological aging. So someone at a given age could have more of this going on, and then they would be considered, you know, sort of have advanced, you know, more than the normal um, aging process going on. Or someone could have, you know, could be a centenarian, you know, and have relatively less aging compared to others. So um, this is sort of a biological level, but what goes on. And um, experts uh, tend to want to call this uh, not normal. You know, that, that is that the goal would be to reduce this and then to live to, you know, live out one's lifespan, you know, 90, you know, or however long it can be, you know, without these changes or with, with less of these changes. Um, so um, sort of jumping from the cellular, or, can I just, uh, I'll ask one more time, hopefully with the last time. Did, did you all see a um, uh, moving slide to associations of muscle mass? Yes, you're doing okay, well now. Good, good. Yep, thank you. Okay. Um, so, so now in terms of clinical, I want to sort of focus and make most of this talk about you know, clinical uh, relevance, um, is that um, muscle mass and strength are some of the strongest um, kind of really predictors of survival. Uh, that are out there, whereas you know diet is um, is actually not as strong. Um, but, um, but however, um, I think that the diet cer certainly um, one one feature of diet that's relevant is having adequate protein that also supports you know muscle mass, lean lean muscle and strength. Um, so, but you know the bottom line is the you know the, the muscular strength. Um, and, and what is it about having, you know, lean muscle, or I'm sorry, lean body, um, you know, really um, it's complex and it's not, you know, just the fact that uh, the person can move around better, you know, with, with getting older, um, but it's also on a cellular level, talking thinking about the aging, that there is less cellular aging when there is more um, muscle, when the body can support more muscle. Um, that has to do with metabolism um, of, this, of the skeletal muscle, um, that uh, it can reduce um, really a lot of inflammation. People talk about it as being a sink, a glucose sink, glucose, uh, excessive glucose and insulin resistance um, you know, can, can accumulate with age and having more muscle um, goes against that. It prevents uh, uh, excessive glucose toxicity and lipid um, uh, reactive uh, 
lipid species, um, which can, goes along with too much glucose. Um, so, so these you can just see in these plots that uh, I don't want to get bogged down, but you see the one on the right has the biggest difference. Um, and this is um, uh, mortality being the, the highest when there is low um, low muscle strength (LMS), where but low muscle mass also you know, higher mortality. So the the skewing it toward the negative. So the darker is sort of you know you're someone who has less muscle, less strength. Um, and the highest is to have both low muscle mass, yes, and low uh, muscle strength, yes. So Two point six six for anyone who's inclined about the statistics of, is the hazard ratio of death. Um, so um, something else is very important in tying back to diet is. Uh, Something called anabolic resistance of aging. This is sort of a hallmark, you know, that goes along with one of those bullet points, which is the, um, the dysregulated nutrient sensing, mitochondrial dysfunction. Going along with that is anabolic resistance. Um, so that, that's a you know fancy term. You know, what anabolism is uh, you know building or growth of, of tissues. In this case, uh, muscle. Um, um, which uh, basically that ability does go down with aging um, due to um, mitochondrial function and also reduction of hormone levels. Um, so it, it can be counteracted through diet. And that is, um, so I'll go into in a few slides, uh, certain essential fatty, uh, sorry, essential amino acids, um, leucine, isoleucine, valine, um, act as nutrient sensors, I think particularly valine, uh, to stimulate muscle growth. So when the when the muscle or the blood, you know, gets some protein, some uh, complete protein such as egg or, you know, it could be a supplement like whey protein or collagen, um, this or meat, um, or can, someone could be vegetarian. There, are, you know, you just have to be more um, kind of conscious to be vegetarian and get complete protein. Um, to whatever source of protein um, uh, stimulates the muscle to grow. So this becomes very important with aging. So here the, the, the slide is on uh, muscle loss uh, with aging. It is found to be about 1% uh, muscle mass and 2 to 3% muscle strength on average. Of course, it varies between people uh, per year uh, once you get past the age of, uh, particularly past the age of 60 or 70. Um, so here's a you know, paper that's pointing to recommendations, um, really evidence-based. It was a, a review of the literature um, that higher quantities of protein, if anyone who thinks about grams, maybe a lot of people don't think about grams, um, but this would be, uh, you know, sort of, um, you'd, you'd get most of the way there with a, you know, four ounce, you know, steak or something. Uh, this picture here, um, to per meal to stimulate uh, this muscle synthesis. So, um, yeah, so, yeah. This is a biological um, schematic where um, comparing young and old, and this is focusing on, on mitochondrial functions. This is the mitochondrial cycle of, um, of uh, oxidative uh, metabolism. Um, so most, most metabolism is oxidative, um, so that's um, aerobic, um, so using oxygen and um, whether it's glucose or uh, fat, you know, it goes to the cycle. But this function is decreased, and not only decreased, but um, there's a, a buildup of reactive oxygen species, so oxidation. Um, and that's because actually there's somewhat backwards flow because there's a decreased, uh, there, there's actually decreased uh, uh, level of um, difference of potential. The potential difference is reduced, therefore the, the chain is not as robust, and it can go backwards. It sort of somewhat backfires. And that's what kind of leads to um, mitochondria are the main source of um, reactive, reactive oxygen species in the body. Um, and this process um, is detrimental, um, sort of consumes the antioxidants and necessary cofactors, uh, which are reduced with aging. And so what can be done? Um, so it's something that's uh, shown, um, or several things are shown, but um, overall inc increasing circadian rhythm um, actually uh, restores necessary cofactor and counteracts this uh, um, oxidative cascade or you know, oxidation is sort of 
one of the main features of aging. Um, so these are um, circadian uh, transcription factors. They're called like the, the transcription clock, uh, BMAL1 and clock. Um, and they're stimulated by um, uh, exercise and by uh, sort of strengthening the circadian rhythm. So I want to leave it at that because everyone sort of heard about circadian rhythm and has a sense, you know, the day night cycle. Um, so I want to go into that on specific slides about, you know, what, you know, I mean, yes, uh, do you want to be awake during the day and asleep at night unless you're, you know, happen to be, you know, nocturnal or night shift or something. Um, but you want to have that circadian rhythm um, of um, having good sleep, which has a variety of functions uh, for counteract aging, um, including improving, um, you know, oxidative uh, function. Uh, so, so going back to, I think this this presentation is sort of going back and forth a bit uh, between the biology, which I feel like is important to really. Um, to understand, you know, um, uh, I guess the points about um, exercise and diet, and then you know, sort of what's what's clinically relevant. So here is a picture of uh, midsection of somebody, um, and there's a concept um, as you many have heard, uh, visceral fat, and this is particularly uh, deleterious or unhealthy. <clears throat> um, it's a feature. It's, been, it's almost synonymous with insulin resistance um, and it's a feature of metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance is sort of the core of metabolic syndrome. Uh, so it's when, um, it, so you can't, you can't totally tell just by looking at somebody uh, because visceral fat is on the inside. Someone can actually be lean and there's a term for that, uh, thin on the outside and fat on the inside, um, uh, TOFI, which is not, which is unhealthy. Um, but certainly, yeah, I mean, having, um, being overweight, having you know, too much um, adipose tissue overall, you know, only increases sort of the chances or um, the, there's a higher association with, uh, with a visceral fat. Um, so, um, so, so rather than, so certainly if someone could get, you know, various scans, actually, I, I do think it's worthwhile to get a DEXA scan, um, although it's not always available to aside from bone um, density is sort of the output of a, of a DEXA scan from, a, from your primary care or other doctor, you know, orders that. But um, um, it also can measure lean mass and fat mass. So your lean mass is very important and sort of trend that over time. But if you don't do that, it's okay. Because um, uh, you can get a sense of your metabolic health. You're, you're talking about the insulin resistance uh, from lipid. The lipid panel is very important your blood pressure, um, and, you know, being at sort of a healthy weight for, for you. Um, uh, so here on the, on the right, you see triglycerides. You want it sort of less than 80 in general. There's some variance on that, but lower is better. And you want your HDL to be high, you know, above 50. And those are the, the two key uh, parameters of a standard lipid panel. Um, and the, these are features of metabolic health. Um, where um, there's not excessive glycerides floating around, uh, which are a feature of insulin resistance and can be a problem if someone's eating too much sugar and carbs, you know, and they're not sort of metabolically healthy. So those are, you know, as you see, the sort of the feature, the definition of metabolic syndrome involves those things. So, yeah, this is just the, uh, so I want to kind of skip over this because I mentioned that um, so there's obesity, you can't tell if someone is technically obese, you know, by BMI doesn't mean that they're unhealthy metabolically. Um, and that's why um, you'd have to have a scan like this is an MRI to show the, the visceral fat, which means fat um, around the organs. Particularly. Um, overall, it is uh, someone who has particular fat in the midsection, the abdomen, more likely has uh, too much visceral fat. Uh, but uh, right. But. Yeah, BMI, you know, is essentially not not that meaningful for purposes of uh, metabolic health. So it's, you have to be more fine grained than that to really know. Um, so one of, one of the key things is um, fatty liver. So as you may have heard, that fatty liver um, is a you know a feature of of um, metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance, and um, that's particularly 
damaging because it reduces liver function and uh, is, um, <clears throat> you know, just sort of very, um, very, very dispensable function, the liver uh, for clearing out um, toxins and for, for, you know, maintaining our, our metabolism. Um, so um, it is found that um, visceral fat is very much linked to dementia. Um, this is again, insulin resistance. And it's been termed um, a form of diabetes, Alzheimer's. So it, the important thing is, um, so it's not to be too, um, you know, just to call it you know, a form of diabetes isn't quite correct. Um, but it is true that the, the vast majority of Alzheimer's, um, you know, one of one of the main or perhaps the main modifiable risk factor is uh, insulin resistance. Um, and um, the, um, so here you can see um, these bar graphs that um, so someone with all this, sorry, these are groups of people uh, on average with Alzheimer's have reduction of glucose uptake to the brain. And that's a feature of insulin resistance. Um, <clears throat> and um, you know, also reduced demand. So there's reduced um, metabolic activity in the brain. Um, whereas actually, if you give someone ketones, um, and this is, you know, done through a diet, and um, so someone builds up ketones in the brain, um, there actually the reduction, there's no significant reduction. This is again, the white bars, Alzheimer's, you know, I mean, it's, there's a trend to reduction, but it's um, essentially the same as uh, so-called healthy, you know, age match control group. So, um, so additional points are that um, with aging, there is increased fat oxidation. And uh, so this is a really a problem um, that there's increased lipid related toxicity. Um, so without getting into you know, too much detail on, on the, the, the bio, um, sort of pathway of, of lipid toxicity, just suffice to say that uh, there's glucose toxicity and there's lipid toxicity and they often run together um, in, in neurodegenerative disease. And I'm focusing on Alzheimer's. Um, it is more direct, I would say for Alzheimer's, but it's very much relevant for ev you know, everybody you know, getting past the age of 50 and uh, in Parkinson's um, as well. Um, so, um, this is just another point that ApoE4 is, is a, just a key thing for everybody. And that is, um, um, it increases the risk of dementia, you know, of, um, of really Alzheimer's type. Um, and, um, just to say that, um, it, it's relevant because it's, it is modifiable. That is, if someone does, you know, decide to get their ApoE4, you know, blood type or gene type from the blood cells, um, then um, if you have, if someone has ApoE4, ApoE4 is a, is a apolipoprotein. It's a protein with, uh, with lipid, is core, and it, it's um, part of the, the sort of LDL um, and the HDL. And it has a key function of being able to clear amyloid. Um, the ApoE4 um, becomes damaged by oxidative stress. And that is the reason why it is, increases the risk of Alzheimer's. And that is because um, there's um, it really, you know, it's sort of on a cellular level, there's buildup of uh, lipid um, in the astrocytes and they're unable to clear the lipids um, and um, eventually in the neurons as well. Um, and so really if someone's ApoE4 positive, it's all the more reason that they need, you know, to, to avoid dementia, to have a um, very insulin sensitive uh, metabolism, uh, which is um, essentially um, would be carbohydrate um, portioned. So, so smaller portions of carbs, you know, cutting out sugar and um, having more healthy fats to replace those calories. Um, and that will reduce uh, oxidative stress. Um, so this is sort of just sort of more graphically, you know, what is the ApoE4? It's these little blue things on the HDL and the LDL, and it transfers the um, lipids. Um, 
So lipids have to be transferred like this because they're not soluble in blood. And this is what the Alzheimer's brain looks like. Um, so it's not the Parkinson's brain, but um, I guess it's particular relevance because um, Alzheimer's is increased in Parkinson's. Um, it's not certainly not rare, I should say, it's actually common in uh, post-mortem exam, someone with Parkinson's, um, that there is amyloid and there's you know, more um, Alzheimer's um, than, than say a control with that. Um, but anyways, um, you know, this is Alzheimer's and um, it, it does relate to um, impaired clearance of, of amyloid um, as well as a bunch of other things. It's, it's sort of not the focus of this, but just to say that that's one thing that um, relates to diet and metabolism, insulin resistance, um, and that is the APOE uh, ability to remove the A beta. Um, so, and you want to have more HDL. One reason is that it um, uh, helps to remove amyloid from the brain, just like it removes fat from all over the body and um, sort of uh, keeps it running, flowing better. Okay, so now I want to talk about a very uh, important topic. It's really, I don't think um, it's really uh, enough to talk about diet without really combined with exercise. Because, uh, you know, a certain diet, um, you know, in terms of studies, um, you know, really doesn't matter as much. Um, however, um, it's diet and exercise. And if someone is exercising, uh, they really need to have adequate nutrients to, to support that. So we're thinking about diet as sort of supporting the exercise process. Um, and so these are all, these are images, um, you know, either equipment, this, so this is simply uh, from the internet, uh, it's a standing punching bag that I'd recommend for anybody who's looking to think about relatively lower cost fitness equipment for aerobic and anaerobic. Um, exercise, you know, muscle strengthening. Um, and here's um, some images pulled from, um, you know, Parkinson's related research and exercise. Um, there's a, this is from Dr. Petzinger at uh, USC, University of South Car Southern California, who's a very prominent researcher in exercise and has found that um, dopamine transporters are elevated from exercise to be the D2 receptors in the brain. And this is, uh, Related um, on a more, much more global level to synaptic plasticity is the term for the ability for the, the brain to change its configuration. Um, with, and synaptic plasticity is really the issue in Parkinson's downstream of cellular loss and loss of dopamine. So to counteract that, um, plastic changes can rewire the brain such that overcoming um, mobility issues, as is well known and just standard of care to have dance, um, boxing, um, and these are particular forms of exercise that involve coordination, balance, and really the movement centers of the brain. Um, so it's not just sort of mindless, you know, I mean, not, nothing against, um, let's say stationary bike or running. And certainly there's, there's some component of, um, of cognitive neural activity as well. Um, but I, I'd say that doing some degree of um, cognitively engaging tasks has the greatest utility uh, for Parkinson's. Okay, and so this segues to the fact that uh, very amazingly, um, simply exercising um, to a, a level that most people can do, which is speed walking on a treadmill. Um, um, and they, they went up um, in intensity because you can, you can go up the speed and also the incline to get your um, heart rate to 60% of max or around 120 beats per minute. Um, so that was the program. And here it's very, very uh, clear. Um, the brain is, so to speak, lit up. Uh, there's uh, uptake uh, demonstrated on, um, this is a, a PET scan. So it's showing the radioactive tracer is remaining in the brain and it's showing up in warmer colors, it means there's higher concentration uh, of, this is a ketone, acetoacetate. So the brain actually um, makes ketones and, and metabolizes ketones um, from, from exercise. And this study had nothing to do with diet. Um, so I guess linking in diet, exercise, and ketones, which will be sort of the end of the talk, 
um, the ketogenic diet forms ketones. Um, it can be just exercise, it can be just diet, or combining the two will have the greatest um, ketones. And as I, as I mentioned before in the previous slide, um, ketone uptake is relatively preserved in the brain. So logically, there's a, you know, it seems that there uh, is a role for ketone um, therapy or, you know, or having ketone metabolism um, in the brains of um, older individuals with insulin resistance, um, including Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Uh, so here's another point, which is um, it shouldn't be just aerobic. So, um, so again, thinking about the treadmill or the um, stationary bike is a great, you know, relatively safe um, aerobic exercise for Parkinson's. And there's some muscular component, um, but it's not enough to have the maximal gains of uh, lean body, that is muscle mass, because it's, you know, it's isolated. So if it's pedaling, it's going to be you know, the quads, a little bit the uh, you know, the hip girdle muscles in the legs, but it's not the upper, you know, it's not the, your core body um, in terms of your abdomen and your, your upper body. Um, and it's not the axial kind of skeleton. Um, so there are other exercises, particularly here are demonstrated deadlifts. If anyone has seen this equipment, the trapezoid, or it could be a barbell. Um, and really, um, I don't want us to alarm anybody because I know you see some, you know, picture of somebody weightlifting. You think that's sort of not appropriate to, for Parkinson's or something. But um, of course, you know, I mean, first of all, you know, th these are just general guidelines, and I, I acknowledge, of course, that um, it's not safe or, or right for for everybody. Um, you know, it could be too far advanced. You know, um, Parkinson's or or aging. You know, to allow for uh, weightlifting. However, uh, many people would be surprised to learn that they could do deadlifts. Um, you know, they may not have the fancy equipment, but barbell is relatively, um, you know, available in um, rec centers and gyms. And you know, barbell um, at the appropriate weight. Um, it's, deadlift is like it sounds: you pick it off the ground, you put it back down. Um, or to get more, you do reps where you don't put it all the way back on the ground. You just get it to just hang, you know, dangling above the ground using your muscles keep it in the air. Um, and this is um, you know, axial loading. So it's um, putting um, pressure um, force onto the bones. And this is what stimulates bone synthesis and bone density. And that's a, a key issue, particularly in older women with uh, fractures. Um, so, so anyway, studies have shown in older women, I think 70 was the mean age or 75, uh, significant increase in bone density by doing deadlifts. You know, they, they were, the study, of course, had to uh, exercise trainer, and that could always help that someone uh, supervising and directing it. But bottom line, you know, deadlifts a great exercise. It is, you know, uh, relatively safe for most people. And another one would be um, hanging from a bar, and, and you know, or if someone's able to do, you know, pull-ups, that's great too. Um, and here's a picture of crunches. Actually, it's not just crunching. Um, this guy, uh, is, he's a, a Peter Atia exercise longevity specialist, doctor. He's doing um, with the heavy weights, um, you know, kind of working his grip strength and uh, upper body strength as well with the weights. Um, okay, so now going back to diet, um, I, I alluded to, you know, the essential amino acids, these are, um, leucine, isoleucine, and valine all stimulate this key enzyme um, for the branch chain amino acids. Uh, for, it's key for um, fatty acid synthesis. And it's also, they're also stimulate uh, muscle uh, repair and regeneration. Um, and um, another point is that fatty acid oxidation, so sort of having more you know, low carb or fatty, uh, healthy fat diet. Um, would sort of enable, increase um, aerobic exercise performance. This has been demonstrated elite, you know, athletes, uh, many of them favor the, the ketogenic diet to perform so-called ultra marathons, talking about, you know, running 100 miles or whatnot, or, um, or rowing, you know, the English Channel or something. Um, so, so if you want ultra performance, but that does translate to, you know, just common, you know, level, that increased performance of endurance can be from the 
um, higher fatty metabolism. Um, so, and this is uh, healthy in the sense that it's uh, insulin sparing. So it keeps insulin very sensitive and uh, able to function better. Okay, so, um, so yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't I really want to spend time on this, but um, it is the case that a low carb diet increases fat oxidation. You can see that demonstrated by the large increase. Um, these are two different diets. So the low carb is with the, um, <clears throat> with the, the open circles and the high carb is in the triangles where it's not as, uh, there's not as much fat oxidation going on. Um, so this is to really be able to, to have oxidative metabolism during exercise as increased by low carb diet, which is what's needed for endurance. Um, um, so leucine is the key for muscle synthesis. Uh, cheese, eggs, meat, fish, yogurt, excellent sources, and um, various protein powders are as well. Um, so it's important to think about, you know, I mean, protein um, is, is complex. There's 26 uh, amino acids. And uh, so you have to sort of think about which ones uh, have more of, of the key ones, the essential amino acids. So not all the same, not all proteins are of equal quality. Um, so, you know, it could be good to sort of meet with a, sort of a nutritional, you know, someone who, who knows, but this is, a, you know, some things that um, people can learn about on their own or, or read about sort of, you know, what foods have more essential amino acids. It could be sort of a Google question, and then you can get sort of uh, data like this from, uh, United States Department of Agriculture and studied how much leucine is in um, these various foods. So think about dairy, meat, fish, eggs are, are great. Um, and so here's um, sort of um, uh, uh, longevity um, expert um, just recommends uh, apportioning protein, mostly for breakfast and dinner, because um, those are the times around the overnight fast to stimulate muscle synthesis the most, whereas lunch doesn't matter as much. Um, okay. um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'm gonna move quickly now. Um, and um, so, so there are um, certain diets that I, I don't want to go into um, um, because uh, I think diet is something that is somewhat um, individual. You know, I mean, I don't think it's realistic for everybody to follow um, so he, he just he just kind of brushed through the you know, details about something called a mind diet was found to reduce the incidence of dementia, but um, I think you know it, it's found that a Mediterranean diet, you know, from all cultures, parts of the world, where that follow um, that were able to have ample seafood and uh, you know um, good water uh, for for vegetables. Um, um, so th this is this is where the data have shown there's a blue zone related to the Mediterranean areas where people live longer and healthier. So this is information that's very important. Um, so I, I would just say Mediterranean diet. You know, the mind diet is very similar. <clears throat> and uh, so yeah, this I think you're getting too specific. Um, but these are you know certain types of foods that have a lot of micronutrients as well as protein. Um, and there are such things as probiotics. Um, so sorry, I mean, I mean prebiotics. It's a little bit prebiotics means it's uh, healthy for the gut microbiome. You can think about fermented foods <clears throat> and you know a lot of fiber in general, foods with fiber. Um, and um, probiotics are um, actually the, the biotic. Um, so like yogurt, or you can take probiotic supplement. I think would be uh, recommended. And here. Um, I just an idea is to take MCT, it's medium chain triglyceride oil, or it comes in a powder. The powder is more palatable in general, and it can dissolve in water. The powder, um, and this can sort of boost uh, healthy uh, fats that turn into ketones relatively quickly. Um, so, um, so two final points. Um, the one is about sleep, and this is. Um, uh, sort of, you know, idea that, so as I said before, the circadian rhythm um, is key for um, counteracting um, the, the loss of metabolic function with aging. 
Um, and so what can be done to improve sleep? Well, it's, it's shown that, again, having more muscle mass, lean muscle, um, and, and in a daily way, sort of maintaining that. So, I mean, it's not like uh, you can just sort of, you know, obtain lean mass from, you know, one exercise session or, you know, it's a sculpted process, you know, a lot of work um, and sort of a daily function to, make, to, first of all, produce it and then to maintain it um, sort of um, it involves the circadian rhythm. And that is to say, um, mechanistically, that muscle is a powerful uh, uh, kind of clock on the on the circadian rhythm, so it it sets the circadian rhythm. And that is, if you exercise you, your muscle, um, then the muscle secretes these uh, um, circadian factors. Um, so this is going to improve sleep because the more awake you are at a, in a very concentrated form, like very awake during the let's say you exercise in the morning before breakfast, then uh, that's when you'll be uh, awake. That's when the muscles will be active activated to uh, produce, um, you know, awake circadian factor. And then also there are circadian factors for nighttime. So there's for both sides. Um, so the brain has to kind of dial down. Um, um, so having circadian rhythm is really the best thing that's, you know, for that. So just some, some things, you know, in the literature, this is the idea of sleep efficiency. So you want to have consolidated sleep and not have, you know, it's not good to wake up a lot during the night. So um, circadian rhythm is, is key for that. Avoiding sugar because uh, sugar has been found to increase cortisol and uh, you know kind of reduce um, nighttime function or, or nighttime um, sleep factors. So I would say particularly you know um, at bedtime to really get reduced or really just get rid of the, the routine of um, desserts. Um, you know or it could be for special occasions or there's things like sugar alcohols that aren't metabolized quite the same way as sugar. Um, for sweet or, or for the sweet tooths among us um, but you know just getting fiber it, fiber slows down carb absorption um, also is uh, is beneficial to strengthen circadian rhythm and then you have to do things to increase your or to build muscle so it sort of should be a daily sort of habit and then there are certain features associated with sleep quality such as sleep spindles and amplitude of really large uh, very consolidated um, brain function of, of slow wave sleep. Um, um, so actually I'm seeing that I've, I've run pretty much to the end now and uh, didn't get to the little study that we did. Um, but I think it's okay because um, this, this was a pilot study. I'll just cut to the chase about it, which is that um, people, you know, where we recruited from, which is uh, Bethesda, Maryland, were happy to, to try it. It wasn't hard to recruit um, from our Parkinson's clinic. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, generally the, the consensus was that, that they liked it. It didn't mean that they you know, wanted to keep doing it, but maybe it's something now that they're familiar with that they'll do intermittently. You know, it's not a black or white thing. Um, so... So sort of what is a ketogenic diet? In general, it would be about 80% lipid um, and be less than 10% carb to really have sustained ketones in your blood. Um, and um, yeah, there's, there's, there's no hazard of going from a normal diet to ketogenic diet and back and forth. Um, and there's some, some people believe that just doing it intermittently can be healthy. Um, we don't have sort of health data. Um, this was just a three week study. So it's not enough time to demonstrate health outcomes. Uh, we, we, our hypothesis was testing with people on a mobility speed assessment called a timed up and go, be faster on a ketogenic diet. We found that that wasn't the case. Um, um, but uh, we found improvements in metabolic parameters, um, which was increased in HDL, reduction of triglyceride, uh, reduction of the um, fasting level of insulin in the blood. Um, and this is very important, you know, for, you know, to sort of long term, if someone's able to achieve that, to have uh, improved um, brain um, metabolic function and also um, a reduction of the uh, reactive oxidation species um, that, that are harmful and sort of promote dementia. Um, so a lot of a lot of dementia specialists or experts have come to say that ketogenic diet or doing some form, you know, it could be a supplement 
there are these sort of expensive, um, you can actually drink a ketone ester. It's, you know, basically gives you ketones, you know, very high level ketones for a period of time before they get metabolized. Um, but it's not, it's not economical for it's sort of $30 for 30 mLs of, of a drink. Um, where, but MCT, you know, is, is what we studied. MCT is, uh, we used an oil uh, formulation. It was actually a, a prepared drink, um, keto cal. Um, any formulation of MCT is relatively affordable. Someone could buy keto cow. It's commercially available. Um, they have these drinks and, or mix it with food. It's sort of like a coconut. It's not coconut oil, but it's sort of a creamy oil that's uh, palatable. Some people just drink it. It's, it's fine. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll conclude to give, give uh, 10 minutes for questions. Um, I mean, these are just sort of the points about our study. There's no significant effect on mobility, um, but it was um, satisfactory, you know, and um, there wasn't a whole lot of, there, there were no serious adverse events. There's something called keto induction, which I'm happy to answer if anyone has a question about um, so keto induction. There, there are some side effects from switching into ketone. They, they could be sort of like fasting, you know, going to fasting definitely has side effects, um, but um, they tend to go away after a week or two. And they, you know, in direct experience with these participants, they're reduced by um, supplementing with uh, um, having diet that has more minerals. So one way is just have more sort of mixed nuts, which are ketogenic. Uh, they provide magnesium, potassium that can be uh, somewhat low when, when someone first starts on a ketogenic diet. Um, and then, uh, So that's, that's it. So I'll stop sharing now. Okay, so we do have several questions and I wanna start a little bit around the, the concept of ketosis. So um, first of all, <laughs> there was questions around, you know, plant-based versus keto, the mind diet and ketogenic, they almost seem to be like complete polar opposites in some ways because the focus with the keto diet seems to be more around the, the lipids, the meats, the, you know. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because with Parkinson's, especially for people who's on, you know, carbidopa, levodopa, and they're taking it every few hours, that's challenging. So can you maybe address that? And you know, what are the benefits and differences between these, these diets in terms of what people are trying to achieve in their, their overall health and, and anti-aging? Yeah, I really appreciate this question. I think it's very important um, that I think there's valid, there's very valid criticism, which I, I, I agree. I see the merits of the criticism of ketogenic diet as you know, is this really a healthy diet for you know most people long term? I mean, there certainly there are keto keto you know kind of adv uh, enthusiasts who have been on it for years, and that, you know. Um, but so I think the, the main thing is that um, you know there are there are not there really are not data per se of a ketogenic diet per se. You know, if you if you could formulate any ketogenic diet or a so-called healthy ketogenic diet that it is unhealthy, because um, first of all, there's historical evidence. You know, there populations of people who were basically ketogenic for the most part their entire lives and you know and they, they were you know I mean, these populations were you know existed this way these are like such as the Inuits or some sort of uh, nomads nomadic tribe in Africa um, so there's that and then there are you know people who've been on it for you know years and they're they're healthy and this they're studied and they have you know very robust cardiovascular health etc um, so but but I think the key thing is that it's easy to have an unhealthy ketogenic diet there's nothing healthy per se about ketogenic diet. It's just, you know, one way to get energy, you know, and there's nothing evil per se about a carbohydrate. Um, but there, but I think that there is um, very clear evidence that too much sugar is bad. What does too much mean? It simply means that the sugar is staying around in your blood, um, which will happen more so on average for someone who's older. Um, and it happens of course, for someone who has diabetes or, um, pre-diabetes pre um, because they can't, they, their insulin is not adequate. Insulin is, is very powerful molecule. It's, it's, it's crucial for um, survival because um, glucose being in the blood is toxic. You know, all the things about diabetes, um, you may know 
causes microvascular damage. These are advanced glycation end products um, that damages, um, you know, organs, it's, you know, damages heart and brain. Um, so, so there needs to be a way to clear the glucose. Now, if you simply just had a diet that had involved less glucose, then it seems like, you know, you're, um, you're sort of, um, you know, less likely to run into that problem. Um, but so, but so going back to the, the basics um, of, of diet is that there, there, there's no really data, and I do not believe. I think people generally don't believe that there, there needs to be, you know, a change. Let's say um, you know, for people to do ketogenic diet to be healthy, um, there may be certain advantage of ketogenic diet. Um, into particularly, you know, we're talking about someone who's at risk for dementia, you know, high risk because they have free signs of it, like some brain atrophy, or they have cognitive impairment, but not quite dementia, um, that, you know, ketones can provide greater energy supply because there's already loss of um, glucose, um, insulin glucose metabolism. So, so that, that's a matter of research. Um, but, you know, actually in my clinical practice, I, I recommend it um, when, when someone is receptive to it um, as sort of one add-on, I'm not saying that it, it's everything, but that plus, you know, so, you know, your sleep quality, you know, having good quality sleep, which is you know, a separate thing, um, but involving daily, you know, activity and exercise and uh, muscle strengthening. So all those things together. Um, but as far as the other diets, um, so they're not exclusive. So um, someone, there, it's been being studied by uh, Wake Forest, uh, Suzanne Croft and colleagues of um, a, a Mediterranean ketogenic diet. So it's very easy to actually have a Mediterranean ketogenic diet. You just lower the portions of carb. Um, but, um, so that, I'm just saying, you know, so they're not exclusive. Um, I don't think that Mediterranean diet, you know, per se, which is, I think people have an idea of what that is. Um, and, or, you know, various other diets that are found to be healthy, such as the MIND diet, which is similar, um, are, you know, are inferior, even though they're not ketogenic. Um, um, but, you know, I think ketogenesis is a matter of research. So it wasn't the core of my presentation today. It's much more about getting adequate protein, that's the message, um, and, um, you know, having some healthy food groups, you know, healthy uh, types of foods, um, which, you know, is in, in diet per se, it's just not, the main thing is to have uh, adequate energy supply and to not cause metabolic syndrome, you know, which, which is a problem. Too much and sugar. you made a lot of comments about the importance of protein just in general health and muscle, you know, mass and, and how that impacts our aging in general. I think the, the, the problem many people have is getting adequate protein while trying to work around their medication schedule. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I was, I was going to I was going to say that as well. Yeah, that's another very important thing is that certainly it is very clear that um, protein, if you eat protein and then you, you know, take levodopa orally, of course, that's the way it's, it's done these days, um, it's going to um, interfere with the absorption in the gut of the levodopa. Um, that may not be a problem for someone who has less um, degree of severity of Parkinson's. So it, te it tends to be seen more of like a wearing off of the levodopa in, in sort of more advanced Parkinson's. You know, Parkinson's has been around for you know, five or 10 years or more. Um, it, it is seen more often in older individuals, so 70 or 80 versus, you know, 50, 60. Um, and, um, and, and that is that, so, yeah, so that, that is a, a key thing. And it's sort of like there are two good things. One is levodopa, the other is protein. So do you, do you have to cut corners, you know, with one or the other? Um, there, there's a strategy, which is, as I said, um, breakfast and dinner are both very important to have more protein. Um, and you can time the levodopa such that it's not um, at the same time as those meals. Um, so you can kind of kind of shift more of the protein to overnight, you know, to your dinner. Um, then that's very a good time for your body to have, you know, while you're sleeping. It's also um, absorbing the protein and distributing it to the muscles, etc. Um, and so um, in, in general, people don't need to take a lot of or take any levodopa overnight. Um, so that could be one way. And then in the future, hopefully there will be more of um, sort of subcutaneous, subcutaneous delivery of levodopa as another solution. 
Um, but yeah, it's just sort of a medication uh, limitation, let's say. And I know that's a frustration for everyone. And, you know, earlier in your talk, you were talking a little bit about, you know, what's going on inside the body, what's going on inside the brain, the telomeres and all this. And one of the things I think many of us have seen um, on social media is ads for all these adaptogens, like different forms of adaptogens to kind of help mitigate some of these things. Do you have any insight into those? Are they for real? Are those things that are worthwhile for people to consider um, as well as some of the other things that you've, you've already talked about today? Yeah, that's a, I think th there are certainly ongoing interest. Um, I think it, it's not quite as established, maybe because some of the adaptogens um, have only been sort of rediscovered I mean, some of them have been around, let's say, in Ayurvedic medicine from the, the Hindu uh, area, um, you know, such as ashwagandha is sort of one of the more prominent ones, um, Indian ginseng, in other words. Um, so so there's a whole, you know, variety of them, but I think they haven't been studied um, as well, but there's certainly a lot of enthusiasm. And I would say, um, yes, uh, I'm you know, personally very interested in um, in sort of I would say at this point I'm exploring with my patients because uh, I haven't had the data, you know, haven't personally, you know, developed enough um, data to really um, to have a plan to recommend people. Um, and I haven't seen, you know, I mean, there there are studies. Maybe ashwagandha again is one of the better studied ones. I'd say that's one that's um, you know seems very good. And in, in, in general, the concept of um, Adaptogens, you know, it seems, yes, that it, this is sort of uh, to take it from good to like excellent, you know, diet to have not only a healthy Mediterranean diet, um, but also, you know, the proper micronutrients, um, you know, and everything that's known, or not just proper for someone who's young, but to kind of counteract, you know, the aging process. Um, and so I would say um, that, however, you know, not to, some people may be worrying, you know, you know, maybe about about you know what to take. But I would say the, the, you get most of your benefit by eating you know healthy foods. You know, of course, uh, many micronutrients are in foods, um, and then supplements will vary between people. Real quick, because uh, not a lot of time, people have to leave. Um, I would say omega three is you know very important. You want to talk about you know proper lipids, healthy lipids, and membrane fluidity. You know, of course, it has clinical, you know, applications for, you know, cardiovascular health, but also for mood and the brain. Um, so I would say, and, and sleep, actually. Um, so getting like, you know, a few, uh, at least a gram or more of, of the specific omega-3s, the EPA, especially, and also the DHA. Um, and um, vitamin D seems very important you know, to supplement because people aren't getting enough sunlight unless you're outside, uh, uh, well, I don't know, in the Southwest uh, US, be careful. But yeah, someone can get adequate sunlight, but most people don't. So you know, vitamin D is good. Um, and then um, I would say, you know, there's certain ones such as like myo inositol or, or inositol um, is um, you know, also very helpful for kind of the nervous system. It's key for nervous system repair um, and then you know, all the, the B vitamins, but like particularly methylated um, forms, methyl folate and methyl B12 um, are sort of very important for the nervous system. Um, so, I mean, those are, you know, they're micronutrients, they're vitamins, cofactors, um, or maybe even co coenzyme Q10 is for the mitochondria. Um, but um, yeah, but I, I, I'm just mentioning them because I do believe that they're important, but I don't know you know, like I recommend it for this person because they have more cardiovascular issues or, or you know. Um, so this is something that I think um, on, on the medicine, Western medicine traditionally, you know, sort of, you know, didn't go into it as much. And there is a you know, branch of, of research. The government has the ODS, Office of Dietary, whatever the S stands for. Um, but, um, you know, but it's, um, there's not as much money in it. So it's, there's not as much, research generated with 
nutrition in general. Well, and I know there's a lot more interest in it nowadays, and I'm glad that it's starting to get a little more interest and a little more focus and research. So thank you for sharing this information. I apologize. I got kicked out of Zoom for a minute, <laughs> um, and I'm back on my phone, um, but I, I apologize, and I appreciate uh, those who maybe have filled in, um, continue to ask the questions and, and you continuing to talk while I was absent. But I want to thank you, Dr. Toy. And um, I, I know that it's a lot of information that you didn't get to cover, but it was very helpful and interesting. And so we have a tradition at PMD Alliance um, where we like to thank our speakers by giving the wave of gratitude. So for those of you, and I can't see everybody right now because I'm on my phone, but who are online still and have their camera on or can turn their camera on if you would give the wave of thanks to Dr. Choi and just thank him so much for joining us today. I hope you can see everybody and thank you. And I appreciate everybody joining us and we will all see you very soon. Thanks to all. Thank you.